Now, let's talk a bit about treatment options. And you can roughly divide these into two major venues of treatment. One I'll call rate control, and the other we'll call rhythm control. And for simplicity, we're going to talk about the rate control options first. In reality, sometimes we do a little of both at the same time. But just to review the different ideas, we'll start with rate control. So remember that the three problems when people go into AFib is they lose their priming pump, they have faster than normal heart rates, and their heart rate is irregular. And we're talking about how fast the bottom chamber goes in terms of these two issues. One strategy, which is pretty simple and pretty straightforward, is to just basically try to slow the heart rate down. So when we do that, we usually give people medicines. And there are several different classes of medicines that we can utilize. The most commonly used one is a beta blocker. And some familiar names for beta blockers include toprol or metoprolol, atenolol, uh, natolol, pindolol. If it ends in an all, it's probably a beta blocker. What these medicines do is they blunt some of the nervous input to the heart. Um, picture the heart is this very richly innervated organ. You know when you exercise, your heart rate normally goes up. When you're asleep or resting, your heart rate comes down. That's all mediated by the nervous input to the heart. These beta blockers effectively blunt some of that nervous input to the heart and dampen how fast those signals can get from the top part of the heart to the bottom part of the heart through that skinny little connector in the middle. And there's a dose-dependent effect. So if folks go into AFib and they're not on any beta blockers, their heart rates may be 140 to 160. If we put them on a small dose of beta blocker, their heart rate may go down to about 120. If we put them on a moderate dose, we might be down to 100 to 110. And if we put them on a robust dose, it may be down to 80 to 90. It has to be individualized to the person, but the idea is usually we can achieve some reasonable degree of heart rate control by titrating these beta blockers appropriately. Some of the limits of these medicines are that if you go in and out of AFib, these medicines slow your heart rate when you're in normal rhythm as well. And they also tend to lower the blood pressure. So it may work very well to control your heart rates when you're in AFib, but if you then pop back into normal rhythm, your heart rate may be particularly slow. And people may not feel well with an excessively slow heart rate in normal rhythm, although it works pretty well to control their fast heart rates when they're in AFib. Likewise, sometimes it can lower the blood pressure to the point where, although we achieve adequate heart rate control, their blood pressure is so low that they start to feel lightheaded and woozy when they stand up or try and do things. So it's ideal when we can find a dose of beta blocker that adequately controls heart rates without excessively overshooting and having too slow heart rates or having excessively low blood pressures. Sometimes we can dial that in, sometimes we can't, but we usually try. There are other classes of medicines that work through a similar idea as these beta blockers. One's called a calcium channel blocker. Common medicines in that group include diltiazem or verapamil. And a third class, which is sort of an old-fashioned class um, and works best at people who aren't particularly active, is digoxin. So people may be on one, two, or three of these medicines in an attempt to try to manage their heart rates when they're in AFib. If their heart rates tend to go too slow when they're in normal rhythm, sometimes we actually have to put a pacemaker in folks in order to support their lower heart rate and then allow the continued use of these heart rate slowing medicines to rein in the fast heart rates. So if you picture the heart rate spectrum from very slow to very fast, normally people live in the middle. When you go into AFib, you're up here in the faster heart rate range. We put you on medicines to try and slow you down. There may be some degree of overshoot where people then tend to go too slow at other times and we use a pacer to prop up the lower heart rate and between the pacer and the meds keep you in the happy middle ground, hopefully free of symptoms. Now, there is another approach for heart rate control that I'll introduce here but is typically not the first line therapy that we choose. Um, I introduce it here because it kind of fits with this heart rate control idea, 
but it's usually our option of last resort. And that involves an AV node ablation. What we do is I put a skinny little catheter up through the groin, and I can park the tip of this catheter right on that skinny little connector that joins the top and bottom chamber of the heart. That's called the AV node, that, that phone line, if you will. Uh, the A stands for atrium, V stands for ventricle, node just means group of cells, and it's essentially the waste of the hourglass electrically. I can put my catheter right on this thing and deliver a little electrical signal through this catheter that cauterizes it and basically takes out the phone line. That electrically divorces the top chamber of the heart from the bottom chamber of the heart and intentionally creates a condition known as heart block. Now, that works well in terms of trying to keep the top chamber of the heart from making the bottom chamber go fast and irregular, but there are some caveats. Um, the benefits are that you don't need any medicines then to slow your heart rate down and wouldn't have any extra lowering of your blood pressure. So it simplifies heart rate control, but the bottom chamber of the heart left on its own is kind of a dumb chamber and it typically doesn't know what to do on its own. It will beat, but typically very, very slowly and unreliably. And you would feel terrible if you had a heart rate of 20 and pauses of varying seconds in duration at times. So we have to put a pacemaker in those folks. And logistically, what we would typically do is put the pacemaker in first, make sure it's pre-installed, there's no issues or problems with the pacemaker, and once we're satisfied with that, come back and do the AV node ablation, which then would leave you pacemaker dependent for the rest of your life. It doesn't fix the AFib. You still may have AFib, but the idea is the bottom part of your heart would be governed entirely by the pacemaker at an even and regular cadence. And you wouldn't feel any of the palpitations or fast heart rates or need any of the medicines to slow your heart rate down. So, the advantages of this strategy are that it works exceedingly well. Um, it's, of all the options, perhaps the most reliable way to make the symptoms of AFib, not the AFib itself, but the symptoms of AFib go away, virtually 100% success rate. And sometimes that's what we're after. Um, it also eliminates, to a large degree, the medicines you might otherwise need for managing your heart rates in AFib. Some folks still have high blood pressure and need to be on blood pressure medicines, but we may not need to use such robust doses of these heart rate controlling medicines otherwise to control your heart rate. Now, the drawbacks to that approach are, number one, you need a pacemaker, which although is a minor surgical procedure, is a procedure nonetheless. Um, takes about an hour to put a pacemaker in. The pacemaker runs on batteries. The batteries are very sophisticated. They last a long time, but not forever. Usually a pacemaker will last about eight to 10 years, and then the little disc under the skin here needs to be replaced. That's about a 30-minute procedure once a decade. You are dependent on the pacemaker for every heartbeat for the rest of your life. Some people have more or less of a psychological barrier with that idea. Um, there are lots of people out there who are pacemaker dependent, and you'd never know it, and they never feel it, but sometimes that's an insurmountable psychological barrier for some folks. Um, when you pace the heart, um, your EKG appears different. So, for example, sometimes when people come into the emergency room having chest pain, we do an EKG on them to see if they're having a heart attack. If you're paced all the time, your EKG appears different, and that would no longer be available to interpret in terms of whether you're having a heart attack or not. There are other ways we can try and determine that, but reviewing your EKG, which is typically one of the first things we do for chest pain patients, you wouldn't be able, we wouldn't be able to interpret that uh, with regard to if you're having a heart attack or not. And the last is that when we artificially pace the heart, it's not quite as efficient as if the heart uses its own normal electrical distribution system. We create a little bit of an electrical wobble in the activation of the bottom chamber. And that does compromise the heart's pumping function a small degree. Typically, this is not perceptible for people who start off with normal heart pump function. But if you had a compromised heart pump function, say from prior heart attacks or other heart disease, a small drop in pumping function based on pacing the heart may cause enough trouble 
that you might have symptoms from it. Uh, there are some other pacing options that if that's your case, we would get into in more detail that are a workaround for that strategy. So the big ideas here in terms of rate control are we have medicines that work for rate control and in general they work pretty well, some limitations. We have procedures, pacemaker and AV node ablation, that work really well for heart rate control but have some concessions in terms of that option. Now, I'm going to switch gears here a little bit and start talking about rhythm control strategies. So it makes some intuitive sense that if we could just prevent you from having AFib, we could eliminate all of these symptoms related to AFib. Unfortunately, that sometimes is harder done than said. Um, but we do have a number of different options to try and do that. Uh, one of the first ones is just restoring people to normal rhythm. So we can do what's called a cardioversion. When we do a cardioversion, uh, we basically reboot your heart's electrical system to get it out of AFib back into normal rhythm. Uh, we do this by putting these big pads, one on the front and one on the back, and we essentially give you a shock between these pads that reboots your, your system. Now, it hurts to do that, so we, tip, we do it with anesthesia. And logistically, the way it goes down is you would come in, usually electively, we put an IV in your arm, the anesthesiologist is there, they give you a little bit of sleepy juice through the IV, you fall asleep for literally about two minutes. While you're asleep, we give you the shock, boom, you're back in normal rhythm. It's a very reliable way to get people back into normal rhythm, but it doesn't do anything to prevent them from just going back into atrial fibrillation again. So if you have a single episode or this is the first time you've had AFib, we can certainly try cardioverting you. Um, the reality of it is when you look at large groups of people, it's the minority of folks, maybe about 30%, who are still in normal rhythm a year later. Now, if you're in that 30%, great. The cardioversion was all you need. We kind of deal with it and work through things and just manage it later if it comes back. But for many folks, they may have a recurrence of AFib. Or perhaps you've already been cardioverted once or twice and you already know that you keep going back into AFib, in which case we want to do more to prevent you from going into AFib, not just get you back into normal rhythm. In that regard, we have a couple options as well. And we have medical treatment options and procedural options. So in terms of the medications, uh, what we usually start off with is an antiarrhythmic medicine. These are pills you take. Most of them are dosed twice a day. Some of them, one of them at least, is dosed once a day. I'll get to that one later. But what these agents do and they, what they have all in common is that they put a little bit of torque on your heart's electrical system. So if you picture our pond model again, where you have all these wavelets, you know, this, the wind whipped up over the pond and all these little ripples and wavelets going on all over the place, when we put you on antiarrhythmic agents, it slows the electrical activation through the top part of the heart. And you can picture it in our pond model like changing the viscosity of the water into oil. So the waves are slower and more undulating, not so fast and choppy. And in essence, we're trying to stabilize the top part of the heart and make it more resistant to degenerating into atrial fibrillation. Now, um, that works to a degree. So, for example, I mentioned if we put you on, if we just cardiovert you and follow you over time, about 30% of folks will be in normal rhythm after a year. If we put you on these antiarrhythmic agents, cardiovert you and follow you, it doubles the odds of staying in normal rhythm to about 60%. But it's still only a little better than a coin toss in terms of efficacy. So, although it helps, it's not curative. Usually we think that if we can prevent the recurrence of AFib to once a year or less and just have to do a periodic cardioversion to get you back into normal rhythm, that may be reasonably acceptable. It's untenable if people just keep going back into it month after month or week after week. It's unrealistic to expect to do cardioversions like that. No one would buy that option. But if we can suppress the recurrence of AFib to rare episodes or no episodes, that would be considered reasonable success of these antiarrhythmic drugs. Now, these drugs are not freebies in terms of risk. So 
Unfortunately, they're neither perfectly effective nor are they perfectly safe. And an important idea here is that there's this potential for proarrhythmic side effects. So it's a little bit of a paradox here, antiarrhythmic drugs, proarrhythmic side effects. But the idea is with that torque on the heart's electrical system, we're trying to close this window of opportunity for AFib as much as possible, but at the same time with the same torque, not open some other window of opportunity for some other rhythm problem that you've never had before. That's what we call the potential proarrhythmic side effect of these antiarrhythmic medicines. And all of the antiarrhythmic medicines have some potential for proarrhythmia. There are certain patients uh, that we don't use certain antiarrhythmic medicines in because there's a heightened risk of proarrhythmia in those circumstances. So of all the medicines we have that are antiarrhythmics, depending on your particular issues and heart history, we may not be able to use some of them and be pushed towards using others. Um, in some cases, some of these medicines are cleared by the kidneys, um, and that, again, eliminates another sec segment or section of antiarrhythmics. So we usually can find at least a antiarrhythmic agent that would be acceptable. Um, sometimes we have several options. Now, um, we have some ways that we can survey for the potential for proarrhythmic side effects and monitor what your risk of proarrhythmia is. And how we do that, again, depends on which antiarrhythmic drug we use. So some of them, we exercise people. Since the risk of proarrhythmia is greater at higher heart rates, we exercise you on the treadmill to crank up your heart rate, and we look for some telltale clues on the EKG that we might be pushing into the trouble zone, in which case we might have to reduce the dose or discontinue that antiarrhythmic agent. With other agents, we look at the EKG. Uh, these agents uh, can affect how long it takes the heart to repolarize, and we can actually measure that by looking at your EKG. And if we see excessive prolongation in what we call the QT interval, then we may have to back off again or eliminate that medicine. Um, now, there's one drug that I mentioned is dosed once a day, and that's called amiodarone. It actually is our most effective antiarrhythmic agent for controlling atrial fibrillation. And you might say, why not use that in everybody? Well, the problem is it has some added potential toxicities that we have to monitor for. In particular, amiodarone is, uh, has the potential over the long term to cause problems with the lungs, the liver, and the thyroid. Now, the likelihood of those things happening is relatively small at the doses we use for managing atrial fibrillation. But nonetheless, they're possible. So we would, if we were to use that medicine, we would typically check your lung function with a breathing test, get a baseline chest x-ray, check your liver enzymes with a blood test, and your thyroid function with a blood test. And then usually for the first year, about every three months, we'd recheck the liver enzymes and the thyroid, and thereafter, at least every six months, recheck those things. If you had breathing troubles, we might go back and repeat the breathing test and look at the chest x-ray, but we don't routinely, routinely survey those things in follow-up other than talking to you and asking about questions. Other potential problems with amiodarone include uh, a tremor, sometimes difficulty with balance, sometimes changes in vision, you get halos around things. Um, so we, we talk to folks, and most of these are reversible if we stop the medicine. The pulmonary one is the one that sometimes doesn't reverse. So it is important to be vigilant when you're on these medicines. You have to maintain a very healthy respect for these medicines, for the potential to cause trouble while we're trying to make you feel better, and make sure that they're adequately effective to justify their ongoing use. If they're not particularly helpful and haven't changed the frequency of your AFib episodes, then there's not much reason to continue them with a known risk of toxicity and limited efficacy. Now, amiodarone may have a, about a 10% better success rate than all of the other antiarrhythmic drugs. So you might get 65 to 70% of folks maintaining normal rhythm at a year. So although it has a slim margin of efficacy over the other ones, it also has some added potential toxicity. Um, usually that toxicity, again, is cumulative dose related. 
So if you're 85 years old, when we're talking about starting this, chances of you developing toxicity on this medicine in the balance of your lifetime is very small. If you're 50, the risk is your exposure is over a much longer interval, and we would typically not choose that as a first-line drug for a younger individual. All right, so there are some limitations for drug therapy for AFib, but sometimes we can find a good solution that's adequate or excellent. Um, if not, we have procedural options for managing AFib, and this is where we start talking about AFib ablation. There's, again, two ways we can do an AFib ablation. One we call our catheter alone AFib ablation, and the other one is called our hybrid ablation. So we'll talk about both of these. At the end of the day, no matter which way we do it, you end up with the same general result. There are some differences, and I'll, I'll talk about those. So the idea behind this is that when people go into AFib, go back to our pond model again, uh, our best understanding of why people go into AFib is that there's some skipped beats that fire off and throw the rest of the atrium into AFib. So in our pond model, picture it like there's some rascal on the other side of the pond with a handful of stones, and every once in a while he starts chucking them in your pond real fast. And you have all these competing wavelets and ripples from these skipped beats that essentially can cause the rest of the atrium to degenerate into AFib. Those hot spots of electrical activity are most typically from the region called the pulmonary veins. So the pulmonary veins, there's typically four of them, two on the left and two on the right, and they bring the oxygenated blood back from the lungs to the back wall of the left atrium where that blood's then going to get pumped through the system and out to your body. These are pretty good sized veins. They're usually about the size of your thumb or your finger. So they're pretty, pretty decent size. There are some, it's, it's not quite as stylized as a pipe going into a boiler where these veins merge into the back wall of the heart and there is a demarcated seam of transition. There is more like a conical transition zone where a vein is merging into back wall of the heart. And there can be some sleeves of heart muscle tissue that extend out into these pulmonary veins, sometimes several centimeters. It's this transition zone here in the sleeves of pulmonary vein leading into the left atrium that are typically the hot spots for these skipped beats that throw people into atrial fibrillation. So if you picture our antiarrhythmic drugs thickening up the viscosity of the water in your pond, we're trying to make the pond more resistant to going into AFib when these stones get chucked in. When we do an AFib ablation, basically we're trying to electrically isolate these pulmonary veins from the rest of the atrium. So if there's firing from within these pulmonary veins, you can think of it like putting a containment buoy around these hot spots of skipped beats. So the pebbles drop inside the containment buoy and the ripples don't get out. And the rest of the atrium out here is unperturbed and you don't go into atrial fibrillation. So it's two angles on the same theme. Logistically, how we get these containment buoys in there is, goes back to the idea of doing an ablation. So this is what I call an AFib ablation as opposed to what we mentioned briefly before, this AV node ablation. Um, what we do is uh, we put a series of catheters through the vein up to the heart, and then we have to get over into the left atrium. That's done with what's called a transeptal catheterization. Basically, we get our catheters over to the left atrium. Then we have a very elaborate computer system that helps us make a three-dimensional model of what your left atrium looks like. Uh, in the preparatory phase to doing this, we typically have folks get a CAT scan. Uh, the CAT scan, I can then, they put the images on a CD, I bring the CD over to the hospital, put it into our computer system, and can make this three-dimensional reconstruction of what your left atrium looks like. Most people do have the four separate pulmonary veins, but occasionally we find that folks may have one big vein on one side, or they might have three veins on the other side. There are unique variations. Uh, in pulmonary venous anatomy. The CAT scan helps me get a road map in terms of what to expect and how to plan my ablation. But when we're in the procedure room, then we can use the CAT scan as a model, and then as we move the catheters around inside the left atrium, we can recreate this three-dimensional model that looks just like the CAT scan. 
and identify all of the pulmonary veins and where they are. We have a special little circular mapping catheter that has a whole series of little electrodes that look like numbers on a clock. And we can park that into the opening of each of these pulmonary veins. And on our elaborate recording system, we can display all the electrical signatures from each of these different electrodes. And we can see that there is electrical activation in these veins. So if you picture this is the back wall of the heart and this is the vein, uh, I take my ablation catheter and basically put it in one spot, deliver the electrical energy. It heats the heart tissue right there and makes a permanent thermal burn um, about the size of the footprint of a pencil eraser. And then I basically walk this catheter around the outside of the pulmonary vein, sequentially delivering these focal spot welds until I get in a complete encircling scar line around the pulmonary vein. So that if there's firing in here, again, it moves through the wall of the heart, basically hits this roadblock and fizzles. And the rest of the atrium out here isn't perturbed by these skipped beats. Now, um, we have to do that for all four pulmonary veins. And we can both make sure that the signals can no longer get into the pulmonary vein by putting our map, our, that circular catheter inside the vein after we've completed the encircling line we see that the electrograms are basically all gone. And we can pace from within the vein and show that the signals can't get out. So we get entrance and exit block from each of the four pulmonary veins. Typically, if you, if you picture the back wall of the heart, like if you're looking at me, there's, there's two veins that come in on the back wall on the right side and two veins that come back on the left side. And sometimes we do these in block. So we go actually around both veins in one giant circle. Sometimes that can actually set people up for another rhythm problem called atrial flutter, where if you picture this, this scar line, this circle, now as the center of a racetrack, and the electrical signals, potentially at least, can loop around the outside of these things in a circle. That can, might fix atrial fibrillation just fine, but now folks may have these atrial flutters. So in order to prevent these atrial flutters, I take, here's one big circular lesion here and one big circular lesion here, and the flutter can potentially loop around this one or around that one, and sometimes it goes around both in a figure of eight. Basically, I draw a line from this scar line to this scar line and do what I call a left atrial roof line, uh, which prevents flutters from looping around these other circuits. Um, so that's the basic idea behind an AFib ablation. In terms of efficacy, in ideal candidates, AFib ablation will prevent recurrent AFib in about 75 to 80 percent of folks. So again, it's not perfect, but it's better than all of our antiarrhythmic drugs in terms of preventing recurrent atrial fibrillation. The benefits of it are that you don't have AFib in the majority of cases. Uh, you may not need medicines to control the AFib, in particular the antiarrhythmic drugs with their potential for proarrhythmic side effects, or for that matter, rate control agents. Since you're not having AFib, you don't need to be on rate controlling drugs to prevent uh, fast rates from AFib. So in, when it works really well, it works really well, and people are delighted. They basically, forget they even have a rhythm problem because there's just stay in normal rhythm. 75 to 80 percent of folks, we can achieve that target on the first go-round. That implies that, um, you know, 20 to 25 percent of folks may have recurrent episodes after one of these AFib ablations. Now, what we do at that point for those folks that have recurrent symptoms kind of depends on how much AFib they have. Some folks may have a spit or a flurry of AFib for five minutes once a year, and we kind of let that go and just say they're happy enough. We don't really need to do a whole lot more. But if they keep coming back with recurrent bouts of atrial fibrillation, then they're still unhappy. In those cases, sometimes they respond better to antiarrhythmic drugs than they may have before the AFib ablation. We might try that. But more likely, what we do is bring those folks back for a redo procedure. And we go back up there with our catheters and we can look at the integrity of these ablation lines where they encircle the pulmonary veins. More often than not, what we find is one or multiple of these veins have become reconnected. Remember I said I do a series of little punctate spot welds 
And when we finish the day the, of the procedure, this scar line in, appears intact, and there's no communication across the scar line. But with time, as the swelling and inflammation from those ablation lesions starts to resolve, just like picture you got a burn on your, on your arm from a match or something, um, it's hot, red, inflamed. Over the course of a couple weeks, it starts to mature into a final form little scar. Same thing happens inside the heart, and there's the potential at least for these little gaps between the lesions. And a thread of, a, of heart tissue may still be viable connecting the vein to the rest of the atrium, and the signals can again get out and throw people into AFib. So we can go back in with our mapping catheter and reassess the integrity of these ablation lines. Sometimes it's only one or two little spots that we have to re-zap and the whole vein set gets re-isolated. In folks that have redo ablations, usually we can recruit at least half of them into the long-term success camp. So with up to two procedures, we get about 85 to 90 percent of people symptom-free long-term. It's still not 100 percent, but it's a pretty good chunk of them. And it's much better in terms of long-term efficacy than long-term antiarrhythmic drug therapy. Now, there are some risks doing an AFib ablation, and those have to be factored in as well. Uh, between 2 and a 4% chance of a complication doing an AFib ablation. Some of those are small, but there are a couple biggies that you have to be aware of. So, for example, we don't want to injure any blood vessels when we put the catheters up through the vein. When I'm doing my ablation, I don't want to have any unintended injury to the heart wall. For example, a perforation of the atrial wall when I'm doing one of my ablations. That potentially could cause literally a hole through the wall of the heart. The blood can leak out into the sac that surrounds the heart and compress the heart. That we, we can monitor for that in real time while we're doing our procedure. We actually have a little ultrasound probe up in the heart that we can in real time see the heart and see if there's any fluid accumulating. If there was a perforation with fluid accumulation, we would have to abort the procedure while we're at and urgently drain that fluid, usually with a needle through the chest wall into the sac that surrounds the heart and drain that fluid out. It's a fully recoverable complication, although it's a bit uh, harrowing at the time, um, but it, it, we have had that happen a couple times. Each time the patient has done very well. They stayed an extra day in the hospital. They went home. All of them essentially came back a month or two later and we picked up where we left off and finished the procedure. Um, but it does result in an incomplete procedure that day and ultimately you may need two procedures to effectively get one job done. Other things we don't want include stroke. So we'll talk about anticoagulation in a minute, but basically we have you on usually pill form blood thinners before and after the procedure, and while we're doing the procedure, we put you on a second intravenous form of a blood thinner to prevent blood clots from forming on these catheters. We don't want any blood clots flicking off, uh, floating through the circulation that could potentially cause a stroke. Risk of stroke is typically less than 1%. Fortunately, we've never had anyone have a stroke from one of these procedures, but I don't want to start. As a precaution, usually the day before we do an AFib ablation, we do something called a transesophageal ultrasound, which is where they numb up the back of your throat and they put this flexible scope down your swallowing tube that goes down right behind the heart. And from that vantage point, they, have, they can get very high resolution ultrasound pictures of the heart and actually see if there's any clots in the left atrium or anywhere else. 98% of the time, we don't see any. Uh, but we want to make sure there aren't any clots because the next day, I'm going to put catheters up there and start twirling them around inside the left atrium, and I don't want to dislodge any clots that could potentially embolize and cause a stroke. So in the unlikely circumstance, we did find a clot on that transesophageal echocardiogram the day before the procedure, it would be a showstopper for that procedure. We would have to make other arrangements. Risk of stroke is low in general. Now, the final thing on the, on the big ticket items of the complication risk is injury to the esophagus. I already mentioned that the swallowing tube or esophagus goes right down behind the heart. So if you picture this is the back wall of the heart, here's the esophagus coming down right behind the heart and I'm going to be putting ablation lesions in from the inside, pushing backwards against the esophagus. 
I don't want to have any thermal injury that can actually injure the esophagus here. Um, in some cases, that can cause an ulcer in the esophagus. And in the worst case scenario, there can actually be a welding of the esophagus to the back wall of the heart and a microperforation here between the esophagus and the heart. That's called an atrioesophageal fistula and can be deadly. The likelihood of that happening is estimated to be about 1 in 10,000. It's a very rare event, but it's, it requires urgent surgery if it's figured out, and it can be deadly. So we do a lot of things to try to minimize the risk of injuring the esophagus. For one, anytime I'm ablating on the back wall of the heart, I use lower power on my ablation, and I don't stay in one place for more than about 15 to 20 seconds to prevent that thermal uh, energy from potentially injuring the esophagus. In essence, we take a shallower divot, if you will, on the back wall of the heart, anywhere where we might be near the esophagus. I also put people on an antacid. I basically treat everybody like they've ha they have an ulcer for a month following an AFib ablation. And we send them home on some of the common names of these antacids are omiprazole um, or pantoprazole or lansoprazole. So uh, you would go home on one of these for a month, depending on what your insurance covers. Um, now, so there is a known risk of complication doing one of these AFib ablations, but the success rate is greater. Now, one additional way to achieve this is what we call our hybrid ablation. So this is, uh, again, at the end of the day, we end up with the same lesion sets as we do with this catheter alone procedure but we get them there in a slightly different way. For a hybrid ablation, I partner with our thoracic surgical colleagues, and you would start off in the operating room. What they do is they, under general anesthesia, they make a small little incision here just below the sternum or the breastbone. There's a, two other little stab wounds here that they use for laparoscopic tools, but essentially they get into the abdominal cavity and then they can get through the diaphragm, which separates the chest from the abdomen, and then into the pericardial space, or the sac that surrounds the heart. They have little fiber optics. They can see what they're doing through this cannula that goes through here. The cannula is about, you know, about three quarters of an inch around. And they can dissect down in there, and they can see into the, into the space behind the heart. And they can actually see the pulmonary veins where they enter into the back wall of the heart. And then they have uh, an ablation catheter that they use. Now, it's a different type of ablation catheter, and it lays down a lesion that's about three centimeters long, a little bit longer than an inch. And it's got some little coils on it, and the thing is shrouded. So the back, the back and the sides of it are covered, and the ablation portion is uh, exposed only on one surface of this ablation catheter. And when they put it on the back wall of the heart. They can actually see the back wall of the heart. They put the catheter there, and they turn on some suction, which basically sucks the thing onto the back wall of the heart, just like a suction cup. So it's very well adherent to the back wall. Then they can turn on the energy to this ablation coil, which they leave on for about 60 to 90 seconds. When they release the suction and take the catheter off, you can see this line that they've ablated. Now, the benefit of this is that the lesion sets that they put in are very robust. And when they overlap these dashes, as opposed to my dots, there's much less chance of a gap forming along the lesion. Um, so they can reach about 80% of where they have to ablate from this approach. But there are a couple areas due to anatomy that they can't actually get to. So, they get about 80% of the lesions put in through this scope that goes directly in. And then the patient comes over to the EP lab while still under general anesthesia. I put my catheters up, get over to the left atrium, and I just have a small little arcs that I have to finish up that they couldn't reach and verify that we have entrance and exit block from all of the pulmonary veins, make sure the roof line is intact, and we're done. The total procedure time is about the same between the two options. Um, it's just a matter of how we get the lesions in there. You're under general anesthesia for both procedures. There are some theoretical advantages to the hybrid approach. 
both in terms of safety and efficacy. So for example, in terms of safety, uh, because the ablation catheter is being applied from the bottom up against the back wall of the heart and the esophagus is down here and the ablation catheter is shrouded, the ablation lesions are directed away from the esophagus and there's this uh, less risk of injuring the esophagus with thermal energy. As well, when they finish the hybrid ablation, they leave a drain in the pericardial space that comes out through the abdominal wall. That drain's gonna be removed usually the following morning. But basically, if while I'm doing my procedure, I end up with a perforation, you already have a drain in there. So the safety factor is more favorable in terms of complications, both avoiding injury to the esophagus and having the pericardial space around the heart already have a drain in it. As well, it may be better in terms of efficacy. So there's less chance for gaps in the lesion set that encircle the pulmonary veins. So the initial data would support that this has, again, about a 10% better efficacy in terms of preventing recurrent AFib than a catheter alone procedure. Now, the compromise is, of course, that you end up with this nifty souvenir incision here, uh, courtesy of the thoracic surgeons which is small, it's about that long, but still it's an incision. People will usually stay two days in the hospital following a hybrid AFib ablation, whereas I'm usually sending them home the morning following the procedure with a catheter alone ablation. There are some additional reasons why we might favor one approach versus another in terms of how we do an ablation. Folks that have very normal size left atrium, paroxysmal AFib, meaning they go in it, they come out of it on a frequent basis, uh, they may be more amendable to catheter ablation. Folks that have much larger atriums or they've been in persistent atrial fibrillation where they've been in it for more than a week or only come out of it with a cardioversion, those folks may be better served with the hybrid ablation. So we would talk in more detail about which type of ablation is most appropriate for any given patient when we see them and take all of these variables into account. So. Um, Following an ablation, we would typically um, have folks back to the office. They would, if they had the hybrid, they'd see the surgeon for follow-up of their incision, usually a week or so later. Um, I would plan to see them back within a couple weeks to a month afterwards to reassess how their symptoms are doing, and then march out from there. If you're on antiarrhythmics coming into the procedure, uh, we may discontinue them briefly before the procedure, or we may continue them for a month or two after the procedure but ultimately our goal would be to see if we could get you off those antiarrhythmic agents and just maintain normal rhythm long term. Now, another important issue to think about is anticoagulation. I mentioned that there is a risk of stroke from doing the procedure, but there's also a risk of stroke from atrial fibrillation itself. Um, not everybody has the same risk of stroke, but if we're doing an atrial fibrillation ablation, no matter what your long-term risk of stroke is, folks are gonna be on a blood thinner for at least a month before and at least three months following an AFib ablation of whichever type we do. Otherwise, then we look at folks in terms of what's your long-term risk of stroke. And there are a variety of risk factors we look for. There's major and minor risk factors. And these things are taken into account to decide how aggressive we should be at trying to lower your long-term risk of stroke. So, for example, the two major risk factors are if your age is over 75 or if you've had a prior stroke or mini-stroke, a TIA before. Those, each of those would put you into the higher risk group by themselves immediately. They're two pointers on the scale. The other ones are minor risk factors and they're one point each. That's if your age is over 65, if you're female, have a history of high blood pressure, diabetes, heart failure, or vascular disease. And that includes coronary artery disease, cerebrovascular disease, or peripheral vascular disease. We total up the points. The more points you have, the higher your risk. If, you're o if you have zero risk factors, your risk is truly very low. And nothing may need to be done to try to prevent strokes as a complication of AFib. If you have one risk factor, your risk is less than 1%, probably about 0.7 based on the studies, 0.7% a year of a stroke on no therapy. For those folks, 
usually it's either aspirin to reduce your risk of stroke or a blood thinner, an anticoagulant, of which we have now three different varieties. There's the tried and true old-fashioned warfarin, which has the advantage of being dirt cheap, um, but requires monitoring in terms of getting your blood drawn to check to see how thin your blood is so we can give you feedback on how much warfarin to take. Uh, there's a therapeutic window that we need to keep you in. We want your blood thin enough to get the benefits of preventing stroke, but not too thin that there's no additional risk lowering for stroke, but your risk of bleeding starts to go up. So the only way to check where you are on that is to sample a blood test. That can either be by a tube of blood in the lab, or sometimes we can poke your finger and get a drop of blood and uh, assay it that way. But then we tell you how much Coumadin to take and when to get it rechecked again. The other two agents are newer. Um, they're easier from a patient perspective, uh, but they're more expensive. One is called Pradoxa and the other is Zeralto. Pradoxa is twice a day, Zeralto is once a day. Um, these agents work through a different mechanism than warfarin, um, but they're equally effective. And uh, the benefits are that we don't have to monitor your blood. Um, it's one dose um, based on your kidney function. Um, and that's it. Um, there's no interactions with foods. So whereas with warfarin, foods that have a lot of vitamin K dependent things, which is a talk of itself, uh, but they can interact with your Coumadin. There are several drugs that can interact with your Coumadin. Amiodarone, one of those antiarrhythmics, being one of the big ones. So we have to take those things into account when we're putting people on warfarin. Uh, the newer agents don't have any of these dietary interactions or uh, to any significant degree any other drug interactions, so they're much simpler. However, they're typically much more expensive. Uh, different insurance companies may or may not cover these agents. So long-term management of stroke risk in atrial fibrillation is something that we uh, individualize depending on a large number of different things. Uh, but those are the available options. Aspirin, nothing. Aspirin alone or one of these anticoagulants. Now, um, let's see. One very important idea to keep in mind in terms of managing AFib is that the management strategies are all directed at symptom control. So we're trying to improve your symptoms. There is no data to date that shows that getting you back in normal rhythm or trying to keep you in normal rhythm either with drugs or with one of these ablation procedures lowers your long-term risk of stroke nor is there any data that shows that doing this makes you live longer. What we do have good data about is that we, if you have symptoms from AFib to begin with, one of these approaches may work well and reduce your burden of symptoms. So symptom management is the primary reason to do this. And there are, we, we have done, the royal we, meaning the medical community at large, has done studies looking at the efficacy of antiarrhythmic drugs in terms of mortality and stroke risk. And the surprising finding was that even when we think we're doing a good job with these medicines and people have no symptoms, their stroke rate doesn't go down. Um, they don't live any longer either. And there's some retrospective data looking at this that suggests maybe maintaining normal rhythm does make you live longer, but being on antiarrhythmic drugs is dangerous, and the two are equally offsetting. So the mortality is equivalent to a rate control strategy. That retrospective look at these trials with the hint at least, this isn't good science to do it this way, but at least the hint that maintaining normal rhythm may convey a mortality benefit was one of the big drivers that led to the development of the AFib ablation. Since if we could do a successful AFib ablation and keep people in normal rhythm without antiarrhythmic drugs, they may actually live longer. The study that's looking at whether that really pans out is ongoing, and it won't be, the data won't be available and we won't have our answer for another several years. It'll be big news when that trial finishes. It's called the Cabana trial, if you want to look it up, C-A-B-A-N-A. -A -A. Um, but for right now, in present day, 
doing an AFib ablation or putting you on drugs to maintain normal rhythm are entirely directed at managing symptoms related to AFib. And it will not change your long-term um, indications to be on blood thinners or not. That's an important idea that oftentimes people come in saying, I want an AFib ablation so I can get off warfarin. And that's not really going to work. Now, um, what we do here, um, I see folks in our office. I'm hoping you'll view this video before you come in to see me. Um, and then we can talk about some of the nuances that we've gone over, hopefully clarify questions for you, try and individualize the plan to you. That's really where the trick is, trying to take your story, your particular issues, and sort through, make sure you understand what AFib is, Make sure we look at why perhaps have you got AFib and are there things that we need to do something about that might actually improve the management of your AFib. And then if we've got all that covered already but you're still having symptoms of AFib, then what can we do to make you feel better? And that may include rate control strategies with medicines, potentially at some point with a pacemaker, or rhythm control strategies. And that may include antiarrhythmic drugs or one of these ablations, of which we've got the catheter alone, AFib ablation, or the hybrid ablation. And our job is to try and walk you through this maze and try and tailor it for your specific needs. So I'm looking forward to meeting you. I hope this has been helpful to you. And I'll be happy to talk to you about any questions that you have when you come and see us. Thank you very much.